लिंक <laughs> फिरोज तुम शुरू करो जो बोलते तक तुम शुरू करो गुड इवनिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस वेबिनार ऑन ईसीसी बेसिक एंड बियॉन्ड This is our ninth lecture. Today's topic is supraventricular tachycardia. Our today's speaker is our teacher, our international advisor, uh, Dr. Rofiq Ahmed sir, and we have got two of our course directors with us, Professor M. Athar Ali and Professor Abdul Wahid Choudhury. And we have got our uh, number of teachers and colleagues, respected persons in our panelists, uh, including Professor Jaki sir. Professor Mohsin Hussain, Professor Orun Maske, Professor M G Azam, Professor Shahjul Banerjee sir, and uh, many other teachers. May I request Professor M Athar Ali sir to say few words about today's topic? Hey, in brief. Act to act to bhul bhulo. Actually, ask the lecture ki Athar bhai di bhi. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, today our speaker is Professor M Athar Ali sir. Uh, we have got our international advisor, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed sir, with us. Uh, may I request Professor Abdul Wahid Choudhury sir to say a few words about today's topic? First, a brief comment, and then Professor Mathar Ali will start his presentation. Uh, I think a lot of people are actually waiting for Mathar Bhai's lecture. Uh, his lecture is always uh, very informative, very entertaining, very funny, very enjoyable. and always you can take something uh, to your home new thing even us who claim to know a little bit we also always come to know a little bit more from his lectures and is simple ventricular tachycardia uh, very favorite in the exam and also very important in the daily practice i think uh, without much ado prasad ali can start uh, our today's lecture athar bhai You are welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, our today's speaker is Professor M. Athar Ali, sir. Uh, I think every one of you know him about him. He is our teacher. He is one of the pioneer in the electrophysiology of Bangladesh. And may I request Professor M. Athar Ali, sir, to start his lecture to deliver his lecture. Professor M. Athar Ali, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Firoz. 
uh, for your uh, nice introduction and professor abdul wadud choudhury and i also thank you very much for your excellent introduction and it is very much uh, not very easy to talk on ecg in front of the such distinguished faculties particularly our teacher rupik sir sodol veraj sir abdulal jamil and professor abdul wadud choudhury and so many uh, professor uh, jagir roshan also and uh, our uh, as you know the there are three segments of our session just after what is uh, dr firoz already told that is not uh, that is not uh, that is not wrong actually after my lecture there will be the most interesting session that will be uh, done by the professor uh, our dr rubik ahmed sir so yes. uh, there will be a second section section that is a most interesting session that is interactive ecg session just after my talk my talk will be very short particularly on the supraventricular tachycardia so i want to share my screen আচ্ছা ক্যান ইউ সি দা স্ক্রিন নো স্যার নট ইয়েট স্যার আপনি কি শেয়ার স্ক্রিনটা খুঁজে পেয়েছেন স্যার শেয়ার স্ক্রিন পেয়েছি কিন্তু আমার দাও আচ্ছা শেয়ার স্ক্রিনে প্রথমে ডাবল ক্লিক করেন স্যার দুইটা ক্লিক করেন আচ্ছা এখনো তো স্লাইড দেখা যাচ্ছে না না এখন হচ্ছে আপনার আপনার স্ক্রিনটা আসবে না স্যার দেখা যাচ্ছে না এখন আসছে হ্যাঁ আপনার স্ক্রিনে যে ফাইলটা করতে যাচ্ছেন ওটাকে ডাবল ক্লিক করেন জাস্ট এ মিনিট হ্যাঁ আপু দেখো তো শেয়ার স্ক্রিনটা প্রথম লেকচারে প্রথম স্লাইডে যান স্যার ব্যাক করে ঠিক আছে স্যার শুরু করেন দেখা যাচ্ছে 
the supracant uh, ventricular tachycardia can be classified into either atrial tachycardia or the yeah, nodal tachycardia. The atrial tachycardia is already discussed by our Dr. Rupi Kavitsar in the previous lecture. I will concentrate just talk on the nodal tachycardia, that is AVNRT, AVRT and junctional tachycardia. Today's lecture, particularly on this. Uh, and supraventricular tachycardia, again, can be subdivided into another group that is called the paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is the special characteristics of the clinical characteristics of these groups of the tachycardia. We start suddenly, stop spontaneously, and usually the mechanism is re-entry. So I will talk supraventricular tachycardia, particularly paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, which includes AVNRT, AVRT, and junctional tachycardia, as because the atrial tachycardia is already discussed by Dr. Rufi Ravet, sir. So this is the group of the supraventricular tachycardia, and ECC is the main. This is the main key for classifying these groups of the tachycardia. First of all, these groups of the tachycardia can be divided into narrow QRS tachycardia and the wide QRS tachycardia by the ECG. And secondly, the narrow QRS tachycardia can be again divided into irregular tachycardia and regular tachycardia. And these are the examples of all the supraventricular tachycardia, that is atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and Atrioventricular nodal tachycardia. These are the examples of the narrow QRS regular and irregular supraventricular tachycardia. And again, the wide QRS tachycardia may be again classified into aberration or with the pre excitation. So these are the groups of the supraventricular tachycardia. And that can be classified on the basis of their ECG. And although there are several numbers of the examples of the supraventricular tachycardia, but we can summarize by ECG, all the supraventricular tachycardia into four groups. That is, this is one of the ECG, that is, this is the regular narrow complex tachycardia. This is one of the presentation of the supraventricular tachycardia, that is regular narrow complex tachycardia. This is another group, that is the regular, that is irregular narrow complex tachycardia. This is also one of the examples of the presentation of the supraventricular tachycardia. This is another group, that is, wide QRS complex tachycardia, that is the regular, that is regular wide complex tachycardia. And this is another group that is the irregular wide complex tachycardia. So these are the four groups of ECG that represent actually the whole groups of the supraventricular tachycardia. So these are the four ECG. Actually, we, if you analyze this, if we can analyze these four ECG, we can, I think, diagnose most of the supraventricular tachycardia. So these are the four groups of the supraventricular tachycardia. Regular narrow complex, irregular narrow complex, regular white complex and irregular white complex. And P, that is the P wave, as you know, that is the systemic approach for the analysis of the arrhythmias. And particularly in this case, particularly for the analysis of the supraventricular tachycardias, this is the P wave that plays the key role for analysis these groups of the supraventricular tachycardias, P. And particularly the characters of the P, that is the morphology of the P wave, axis of the P wave, RPR and the RP relationship of the P wave and relation of the P wave the QRS complex. These are the four important criteria of the P wave. So we have to find out to see the P waves in the supraventricular tachycardia, whether it is seen or not seen. And then we have to analyze the morphology axis, PR and RP and the relation of the QRS complex. So these are the key ways to diagnose the supraventricular tachycardia. And not only the P, all these criteria, P rate has got also some important roles for classifying the supraventricular tachycardia. As for example, sinus tachycardia, usually the rate is more than 100 beats per minute. And this is the so this is the sinus tachycardia, the rate is usually more than 100 beats per minute. This is the atrial tachycardia. The rate is usually 150 plus minus 50 beats per minute. This is the supraventricular tachycardia. The rate is usually 200 plus minus 50 beats per minute. And this is the atrial flutter. And this is the atrial fibrillation. So there is some unknown reason. There are some rate relationship of this types of the tachycardia with the... So P rate, that is the rate of the atrial depolarization or the P rate 
or we can see sometimes it is a flatter rate of the fibrillation rate. So it is the actual depolarization rate that helps to diagnose the supraventricular tachycardia. So rate has got also some important role. As for example, this is one of the examples of the narrow complex regular tachycardia. This is the narrow complex regular tachycardia. Here the heart rate is 150 beats per minute. You see the rate is in the rate is about that is P rate is about 300. Here see. This is the P, this is the P, and the rate is nearly 300 bits per minute. There is the actual depolarization rate of the P rate. And also, in this case, also the P rate is nearly 300. So, from the rate, what we can suspect? This can be a case of the atrial flutter, as because we know the rate of the uh, atrial flutter is P rate is nearly about 300 bits per minute plus plus 50. So, this is the, by analyzing the P rate, we can tell that this may be a case of the supraphetic, that is the atrial supraventricular tachycardia, particularly the atrial fata. And if we further analysis, then we can see there is the short tooth appearance of the, there is no clean cut pures, this is the no isolectic line. So these are the suggestion of the atrial fata. So this is the atrial fata. This, this, is, this is the example of the atrial fata. But sometimes the P waves are not similar. As for example, in this case, this is the P wave, this is the P wave. The PUFs are very clean cut and something not uneven, that is not usual like the atrial fata. So big size the P waves. So, but the rate is nearly 300. The rate is 300, that rate size is the atrial fata and the P wave morphology is like this. And here you can see this is the positive P waves and here you can see the negative P waves. And the rate is fixed, that is atrial, that is the 150 rate, that is fixed 150 rate. So that is atrial rate 300, Ventricular rate 150, that is two is to one conduction, no isolectic line, and and the short tooth of the flutter appearance all suggest this can be a case of the atrial flutter. So there is the P wave morphology, P wave rate has got some important role for classifying these groups of the narrow complex regular tachycardia. What type of it is? I will not discuss it further. It was it is shown by the uh, Dr. Robi Kamesar in the previous lecture, but just as it has got some relation with the supraventricular tachycardia. So this is the example how we can classify. That is how we can analyze that is supraventricular tachycardia. So here the P is unusual as because this patient has got the structural heart disease. This is the case of the tetralogy of the flat. So this is the result. The P looks like this, but not in the previous ECG. So. But the location of the P has got tremendous role. This slide was shown by Dr. Opi Kamesar in previous lecture. I will again show this as because this conception is very important for analyzing the supraventricular tachycardia as because the relation of the P with the QRS complex, the location of the P in the ECG is very much important. As for example, in the first row, there is no P wave, visible P wave. This is the QRS complex. The P is within the QRS complex. That is, this may be a case of the supraventricular tachycardia where we cannot see the P wave. And sometimes you can see the P wave just after the QRS. And but the P wave is just close to the QRS complex. The, uh, the interval from the R to P is less than 80 milliseconds. That is uh, less than the two small squares. So this may be one of the location of the P wave. That is the RP relation. That is the interval may be less than 80 milliseconds. And again, the P wave location may be further away from the previous QRS complex. That is the inverted P and the RP, that is the R and this is the P. This interval may be more than more, more than 80 milliseconds. That is more than two small squares. So this, and this is again, another is a, another kind of the supraventricular tachycardia where the location of the P wave may be just before the next QRS complex, but the P is positive. So this, this kind of the, these are the long RP tachycardia. That is the R and this is the P. And this is the P and this is the R. So RP is larger, longer than the PR. So this is the long RP tachycardia, but the P is positive here. And this is another group. This is the R and this is the P. That is RP, the long RP tachycardia, but P is inverted here. So these are by location. These are the groups of the tachycardia. So we have to see, we cannot see, we may not see that a P wave, that is, there is no P wave. P wave just up the QRS complex, that is RP is less than 80 milliseconds. P wave is further away from the previous QRS complex, that is RP is more than 80 milliseconds. 
or PUA may be situated just before the next key, QRS, that is, but the, it may be positive. So these are the groups of the uh, I mean, locations of the P waves that helps to diagnose the supraventricular tachycardia. So this is an important slide that was shown by Dr. Romy Kavitsar in the previous lecture. And so by summary, what we can see, there may be no P wave. Examples of the AV, NRP or junctional tachycardia or maybe upright P wave just before the next QRS complex. This is the example. That can be a case of the sinus tachycardia or sinoatrial reentry tachycardia or atrial tachycardia sometimes. Or P wave may be retro P wave may be just after the QRS complex like this. This. When the RP, that is the RP uh, interval is less than 80 milliseconds, it is avianity like this. It is avianity most likely or when the RP interval is more than 80 milliseconds, it can be AVRT like this. Or sometimes it can be the junction of the as well. And long RP take it, yeah? These are the long RP take it, yeah? That is one group. This is the uh, this is one, one group where the examples are like this. Or this is another group where the examples like this. That is the atrial take it or atypical AVRT. So by location of the PO in relation to the QRS complex has got tremendous role for classifying supraventricular regular tachycardia, what it can be. This is an example of the regular narrow complex tachycardia where heart rate is 150, it is regular. This is the location of the P wave, that is the P is positive and just before the QRS complex. So by definition, this is the long RP tachycardia, that is RP, this is the long RP tachycardia. And these are the differential diagnosis that is the sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, AVRT or AVRT. All we can consider as the differential diagnosis in such type of the narrow complex regular tachycardia. But what is actually it is? As because it is the sinus tachycardia, as because the P wave is situated just before the QRS complex and P wave is positive and the PR interval is more than 120 milliseconds. If it were less than one two millisecond, we should consider other diagnosis. But as it is more than one two millisecond, this is the classic example of the sinus tachycardia. So, sinus tachycardia is one of the, one of the example of the regular supraventricular tachycardia. This is one of the examples of the long RP tachycardia, and the main characteristics of the supraventricular tachycardia is the location of the P wave. That is, the P should be in front of the QRS complex. That P must be positive in at least lead two. And the PR relation is usually more than 120 milliseconds. So this is the sinus tachycardia. But these are the differential diagnosis. Academically, you can say these are the differential diagnosis, no problem. This is another example where this is the narrow complex regular tachycardia. This is the regular narrow complex tachycardia. And the other one is the irregular tachycardia. In case of the regular narrow complex tachycardia, the classic example is the paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, as we know. And this is another group of the target, and there's irregular narrow complex target. So this is the way, simple way, to classify the narrow complex target as into two groups, that is the regular and the irregular. The examples of the irregular target are usually atrial fibrillation, atrial target, or the atrial flutter with the variable block. So the narrow complex regular target, again, by this way, whether it is regular or irregular, we can classify and and you can pinpoint the diagnosis, what the diagnosis is going toward the diagnosis, what it can be. That is the regular and the irregular. And this is the inside of the heart. This is the atrial area. This is the sinus node. This is the atrial ventricular node. This irregular tachycardias are usually originated from the atrium. And the regular paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias are usually originated from the nodal area, that is the AV node. So this is the way that is the nodal tachycardias are usually regular and uh, whether there uh, a few waves can be seen or not these are the regular take ideas and atrial take ideas in some ways whether it is atrial fibrillation or atrial take idea or atrial flutter with the variable block in some ways they show their irregularity so this is the way we can uh, also analyze the substrate of origin of this group of the take idea, whether it has a atrial or the nodal areas in this picture, you can see this is the tachycardia circuit within the AV node. 
this is the re-entry of the impulse, that is the re-entry circuit of the impulse. The impulse is coming from the atrium towards the ventricle and again from the ventricle to the atrium. This, so you need the two pathways from atrium to the ventricle and again from the ventricle to the atrium. And depending on these pathways, that is which pathway the taking care should utilize, the pathways are the one is the slow pathway and another is the fast pathway. So which pathway taking care utilizes that determines where should be the PO location. Either the take area, the anti-grade pathway may be slow and the retrograde pathway may be the fast, or the anti-grade pathway may be the fast, or the retrograde pathway may be the slow. And depending uh, depending on this, that is pathway utilization for the anti-grade and the retrograde conduction, and that determines the location of the POA, whether the POA will be very much close to the previous QRS complex, or the POA may be just before the next QRS complex. So this is the types of the take area. And this is the location of the POA. In case of the slow, fast atrial take area, this is the uh, location of the POA just after the QRS complex. That is, the retrograde POA takes only very short time to come into the atrium from the ventricle. So this is the uh, location of the POA. And this is the typical example. That is the examples of the typical or common atrioventricular nodal take area. And here the POA takes a longer time to come into the QRS complex, that is, it is located as the retrograde pathway is from ventricle to the atrium is slow. So it takes longer time from ventricle to the atrium to come. So it is situated just before the next QRS complex. And it is coming from the ventricle to the atrium as because this is these are the inverted. So this is the long RP take idea. The POA is retrograde. And this proves, this is one of the example of the long take idea. And this can be happening in case of the atrium typically AVNRP. And this is the inside of the heart. We can see the location of the AV node. This is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And this is the upper part and this is the lower part. This is the ostium of the coronary sinus. And as because the AVNRT, it needs two pathways. One pathway is slow and one pathway is fast. As for example, this is the anatomical location of the slow pathway that is in this figure. This is the lower part of the AV node. The AV node is situated in the triangle of the coach that is bounded entirely by the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, behind by a ligament from the upper part from here to the IVC. And the apex is formed by these two, and the base is formed by the coronary stem. So this is the anatomical location of the if you know that the lower part of the atrium, right atrium at the septal aspect. So this is the location of the AV node. And it, at its upper part, situated the fast pathway. The fast pathway is situated here. And slow pathway is situated the lower part. So there is physiologically two paths. That is the upper part, that is the fast pathway and the slow pathway. And these two pathways connected proximally at the apex and distally by the physiological. So it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry. That is, it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry, which includes, it needs the two pathways of two degrees of conduction. That is, one is slow conduction, and one is the fast conduction. These two pathways should be connected at either side. So it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry. So this is the basic criteria of the re-entry, and this is the basic criteria of the re-entry mechanism in the case of the AV nodal re-entry take area. And there are two pathways situated in the AV node. That is one is the first pathway and one is the second pathway. And this is present in nearly about 30, 35% of the population. But not all person who has got the fast and slow pathway can present it with the supraventricular take area. Supraventricular take area needs some of the other criteria to be presented. So this can be present in case of nearly as much as up to 35% of the population. But for the re-entry to happen, it needs two pathways. That is, one is the fast pathway, one is the slow pathway in case of the avionodal re-entry take area. And the circuit is formed by the upper part is by the atrium, then the node, and this is the ventricle. So this includes the circuit. The circuit includes all the three structures. That is, three structures are in, uh, uh, required for the re-entry to happen in case of the avionodal re-entry take area. But as because the take area circuit is situated within the node, 
So it is called the AV nodal ray entry together. And this is the fluoroscopic view. We can see this fluoroscopic view. This is the catheter. This is situated at the upper part of the AV node that is near the first pathway. And this is lower part that is the slow pathway. So there is physiologically at least two pathways in case of the AV nodal ray entry together. And this is the basic mechanism of the AV nodal ray entry together. And this concept is required to analyze where should be the POA location? As because in this example, this is the ECG. Here we cannot see the P waves. This is the regular narrow complex take area, but we cannot see the P wave. That is P wave is within where it is the P wave. The P wave is within the QRS complex. And this is the take as the P wave is just after the QRS complex. Just after the QRS complex. There is no P wave. And this is the P wave location. Here, this is the P wave location that gives rise to the incomplete RB pattern in the D1. This is one of the example that is the pseudo R in case of the uh, AVNRT. So this is the POA location. And this is the, again, the POA location in the inferior lead. This is the retrograde P. This retrograde P is inverted in case of the two, three AVA. So this is the POA location. This is the POA location. That is the inverted POA just after the QRS complex within the two small square. That is the interval from the R to P is less than 80 millisecond. Here again, R to P is less than 80 millisecond. So P wave is situated just within the 80 millisecond from the previous QRS complex. The P wave is inverted. That means the P wave is, that is the retrograde. And this explain that is the AVNRT. So AVNRT may be either there should not be any visible P waves. There is a P wave maybe within the QRS complex or P wave may be just after the QRS complex. But what determines that is whether the POA will be the within the QRS complex or just after the QRS. What factors determines? It is the exit of the QRS complex. That is the exit. That is the exit of the POA. Exit of the POA from the uh, from the uh, that is the circuit. That is the this circuit is uh, that is the re-entry circuit is within the AV node. It has got exit below to the ventricle and above to the atrium. And it is the relation of the exit from the ventricle to the atrium that determines what should be the retrograde POA. If the exit is simultaneous, that is the exit into the ventricle and the atrium is at the same time, there should be no QRS. But if the exit is little after the, uh, that is QRS complex, that will determine the location of the POA. As for example, we have the exit of the retrograde P from the AV node to the atrium is just within the 80 millisecond, not at the same time but within the 80 millisecond of the QRS complex. So this is the location. And this determines the location of the POA in the ECG, where it should be. And this is the classic. There is no should not be different. We can academically conclude some differential diagnosis. All the differential diagnosis, that is, can be AVRT. This can be uh, atrial tachycardia. It can be junctional tachycardia. But classically, when there should not be visible POA, it is almost certain we are dealing with the AVNRT. And when the POA will should be just after the QRS complex within 80 millisecond, again, we should think that we are dealing with the AVNRT. So these are two examples of the AVNRT is where it can be. This is called the pseudo R and this is called the pseudo S. These are the two characteristics of the AVNRT. And this is one of the proof we can see in the EP lab that both the atrium and ventricle are contracting simultaneously. This is the, this is the, this part of the ECG during the sinus rhythm. They are participating, you can see, this is the P wave and this is the QRS complex. This is the P wave and QRS complex. That is P, that is the QRS complex after the P wave. But here we can see both the P and QRS complex are at the same time. That is simultaneous activation of both the atrium and ventricle. That is P wave is within the QRS complex. You see, this is the QRS complex and this is the location of the P wave. That is P wave is within the duration of the QRS complex. Here in this case, we cannot see the P wave with the 2 wave lead ECG. So this is the proof that the P wave, that is, a, that is a, both the atrium and ventricle are activating simultaneously by the re-entry circuit within the AV node. And this is one of the definite proof that the, this can be a case of the AV nodal re-entry take idea. There's some, some differential diagnosis, but this is the classic example of the AV nodal re-entry take idea. In this case, we will not see the location of the P wave. So in summary, in case of AVNRT, the P wave location can be like this. 
that is there may not be visible p waves or if p wave is present it is always inverted in case of the 2 3 and av as because the p wave is retrograde from av node into the atrium or it can produce that is this retrograde p wave can give rise to the development of the pseudo s in lead 2 3 and av or it can give rise to the development of the pseudo r in lead v1 or in case of the fast slow avinati tegeda if the retrograde pathway is slow it will take longer time and at that time the that the pu wave may be just before the next qrs complex that giving rise to the long rp tegeda what happened in case of the atypical avinati so this is the pu wave summary of analysis in case of the avnat these are the examples where should be the p wave location this is another examples of the narrow complex regular tegedia you see this is the narrow complex regular tegedia and this is the r and this is the p in case of the lead v1 you can see this is the r and this is the p and the r to p is one to nearly about more than three small square that is more than 120 millisecond and again there is some Unusual morphology of the P waves in case of the lead two, so there should be the presence of the P wave that can give rise to the such type of the uh, T wave morphology in case of the lead two. So, but whatever may be in the lead two, we can see clearly that is the location of the P wave in case of the lead V one. So, this is the short R P take idea, R P short R P take idea. But although it is short R P, but still the R P interval is more than one to twenty millisecond. this cannot be in case of the avnrt as because in avnrt the p wave should be within the qrs complex or within the 80 millisecond from the previous qrs complex so this is the example of the avrt atrio ventricular reentry tegeda dear participant avrt atrio ventricular reentry tegeda simply we can call the avrt so this is the avrt where the location of the p wave from the previous qrs complex after the 80 millisecond usually it should be the avrt so this is the example of the avrt and in case of the avrt this is the reentry circuit that is one is the integrated pathway usually the normal conduction system that is his parkinson system this is the av node this is the bundle of his this is the led bundle this is the right bundle this is the normal conduction system and this is the retrograde pathway usually the accessory pathway is the retrograde pathway inverse may be true that is the integrate may be this way retrograde may be this way that will give rise to the orthotropic tachycardia that is antitropic tachycardia that that will be described in another class just after uh, two weeks so i will not discuss that issue later today but for the analysis of supraventricular tachycardia this is the atrio ventricular reentry tachycardia this is the reentry circuit and the circuit starts from the atrium going to the ventricle and you get back to the atrium through the accessory pathway so it, this is the atrio ventricular reentry tachycardia so the tachycardia circuit leads atrium to ventricle usually by the slow pathway that is the normal his parenteral contraction system and ventricle to atrial to atrium usually faster pathway that is more faster than the normal his parenteral system this is faster in relation to the normal contraction system so this is the faster pathway so it has got again fulfill the reentry criteria that is it has got the two pathways one is slower that is the normal his parenteral system another is the faster that is the retrograde contraction system that is connected above at the atrium and connected below at the ventricle so it fulfill the criteria of the reentry circuit so this is the uh, reentry tachycardia and example of the atrio ventricular node uh, reentry tachycardia and the ecg of this kinds of the tachycardia that is the sinus that is resting ecg either may be this type or may be this type if the conduction this is the accessory pathway if the accessory pathway conducts integratedly this is the sinus tachycardia that is the sinus rhythm along with the his parkinson system it will produce the delta wave this is the delta wave so this is the example of the uh, this this are the delta wave that is the classic delta wave this is produced when this impulse is conducted both so the accessory pathway and through the normal conduction system from atrium to the ventricle so this is the example of the delta wave and we can see it in the sinus rhythm but 
when this accessory pathway conducts only retrogradely from ventricle to the atrium, not from atria to the ventricle integrally, then there will be such type of ECG. We will not see the delta wave. So these kinds of the is, uh, is called the concealed pathway. So the pathway that is the sinus rhythm, but whatever may be the pathway, either it is manifest or it is the concealed, this will give rise to the development of these types of the tachycardia. These are the narrow complex tachycardia that can happen in case of the atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. This is the this is the location of the P wave. This is the R and this is the P. This is the R and the P this is the P. The P wave is retrograde as it is inverted. Here you can see also suspect this may be the location of the P wave. Here, here or here. So these are the short RP tachycardia. That is RP is shorter than the PR. This is the short RP tachycardia. But the interval from the R to P is more than 80 milliseconds. So this is the narrow complex, regular, short RP tachycardia. But the R to P is more than 80 milliseconds. So this can be, this should not be in case of the AVNRT. This can be example of the AVRT. And sometimes in case of the AVRT, particularly this type of the AVRT, that is the paroxysmal junction of the NT tachycardia, the POA may be just before the QRS complex, giving rise to the long RP tachycardia, that is R at the P, and this is the P to the R. So RP is longer than the PR, so long RP tachycardia. So the whatever may be the AVRT, that is the sinus rhythm, either delta wave present or not, the ECG presentation of the AVRT would be like this, short RP tachycardia, but after the 80 milliseconds, or the long RP tachycardia just before the next QRS complex, but this QF should be inverted. This should not be the positive, as because the atrium is activated from ventricle to the atrium by the retrograde wave. So this should be the inverted P wave. And this is the, uh, this is the determinants of location of the P wave, as because this is the location of the QRS complex and the exit of the P wave, depending upon the location of the accessory complex, that will be described in another session. That is, it can be exit to the atrium maybe here, or maybe here, or maybe here. So the location of the P, P wave in relation to the QRS complex is not fixed. It can be just at the close to the QRS complex, just after the QRS complex, or significantly after the QRS complex, that is the next, before the next QRS complex. So these are the factors. That's at the location of the location of the uh, uh, that is the atrial insertion site of the accessory pathway and the speed of the conduction from the ventricle to the atrium from the accessory pathway that determines what should be the P wave location in the ECG. So these are the determinants of the P wave location. The, what is message is that the P wave location is not fixed. The P wave should be inverted and P wave should be seen particularly. Uh, just after the QRS complex on the segment of the ST segment or before the next QRS complex and giving rise to the either short RP or the long RP tachycardia in case of the AVRT. And this is another example. Here you can see this is the look at this should be the location of the P wave, but this is the again. If this is the location of the P wave, this is the location of the P wave, we can see this is an example of the AVRT. But again, from the 12 day DCG, the location of the P wave in case of the V4, V5, and V6 is inverted, that is the retrograde. And as the impulse is going away from this location, that is the inverted in case of the V4, V5, and V6, this can be a case of the accessory pathway situated at the lateral side. That may be a that is the accessory pathway, left lateral type of accessory pathway. That's, that will be discussed in the another session. But true is that even in case of the AVRT, by analyzing the uh, narrow complex regular tachycardia and assuming the location of the PO inverted PO, we can suspect what should be the location of the uh, PO that is the accessory pathway in case of the uh, of that patient. So this is another example. These are the differential diagnosis we should always consider. These groups of the differential diagnosis in case of analyzing the narrow complex regular take idea. But whatever the uh, differential diagnosis, this is an example of the AVRT, that is atrioventricular take idea example. This is another example, that is the, this is the long RP take idea, R, P, 
RP. So this is the example of the long RP tegator. This is the narrow complex regular tegator. But other than the P wave, something else we have to see for analyzing. What is the striking feature in this ECG? They are participant. I think you can see the amplitude of the QRS complex are not fixed. One QRS complex amplitude is larger and is small, large and small. This is called the QRS alternance, electrical alternance. So presence of the electrical alternance in case of the narrow complex regular tachycardia is a diagnostic for the accessory pathway. This can be happen also in case of the AVRT as because in case of the atypical AVRT, this is not 100% proof, but this gives some clue that is more likely to be the AVRT because of the presence of the accessory that is the QRS alternance more than the atypical AVRT. This is the long RP tag area. It may be in case of the fast slow, that is anti-grade pathway is fast, retrograde pathway is slow in case of the AVRT, but it is more likely AVRT as because the electrical alternance is particularly the function of the heart rate. The greater the heart rate, there is the more chance of developing the QRS alternance. And it is the function of the re-entry. Any kinds of the re-entry take area can give rise to such type of QRS alternance. But it is commoner in case of AVRT than the AVNRT. So this should be a case of the AVRT. But this type of the QRS alternance, also we can see in case of the sinus rhythm. If it is present in case of the sinus rhythm, that gives some other clues of diagnosis, particularly the cardiac temporate and the cardiomyopathy. So QRS alternance, particularly the amplitude of the QRS alternance during the narrow complex regular take area, more likely AVRT than the AVNRT, but during the sinus rhythm, this should be a case of the cardiac temporate or the cardiomyopathy. That is the heart failure particularly. This is the another, another issues that we have to consider for analyzing the supraventricular tachycardia other than P wave. What is the hallmark in this ECG? This is the narrow complex regular tachycardia. That is the narrow complex regular tachycardia. This is the supraventricular tachycardia. The hallmark is the ST depression, gross ST depression, all the leads, and even the ST elevation in case of the AVR. And easily we can see this can be a case of the left vein disease. Particularly, our Professor Abdullah Choudhury will be happy to diagnose it. Uh, uh, there is a uh, late vein disease as because there is ST elevation, gross global ST depression, or the ST elevation in, in case of the AVRT. But other than the POF, other than the QRS alternance, this is another important clue for analyzing the regular narrow complex tachycardia. And this ST depression, although this patient may have the concomitant uh, coronary disease, but it does not need to happen. It is, it is the characteristics of the AVRT, that is atrioventricular reentry take area. If this type of the ST depression is present, the more chance of having the AVRT, that is atrioventricular reentry take area, than the AVNRT. So QRS alternance and ST depression are two other additional points other than the POF that we have to analyze for diagnosis of the supraventricular, paroxysmal supraventricular take area. So in summary, these are the, the some points that is the presence of the pseudo R or pseudo S, ST depression, ST elevation in AVR, retrograde POF on the ST segment, at the ST segment or beginning of the TOF or QRS alternates. These are the some of the points that we have to consider for differentiating between the AVNRT or AVRT that I have already discussed. So other than the POF location, POF morphology and the POF axis, these are the points that you have to consider for the differential diagnosis of the AVNRT or AVRTS because these two are the more common take area. But in addition to the, uh, in addition to these kinds of the modalities, sometimes application of the adenosine can help to diagnose these kinds of the narrow complex take area. This is the regular narrow complex take area, but the application of the adenosine clears that is the rate of the PFDL is 300. So, this is the adenosine that helps to differentiate these kinds of the regular narrow complex tachycardia. This is the example of the atrial flutter. And this atrial tachycardia, that is this regular narrow complex tachycardia, terminates in the sinus rhythm. This is the POF, this is the POF, this is the POF, that is the sinus rhythm. That is termination of the termination of the tachycardia and clearing of unmasking 
the POF that helps to differentiate what it can be either the atrial tachycardia or the AV nodal dependent tachycardia. And by this way, by application of the adenosine, we can differentiate, we can classify the narrow complex regular tachycardia is nodal dependent like the AVRT or AVRT or nodal independent that is not dependent on the AV node like this example that is the atrial fatter or atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation. And, but there are some cases where this is the, this is the way of differentiating the, these groups of the tachycardia into the either what is is AV node dependent or AV node independent, but not always adenosine can terminate this tachycardia. This is one of the example. This is one of the example of the long IRP tachycardia. I have already shown this ECG. This is the example of the long IRP tachycardia. This type of the tachycardia, sometimes where we can see, particularly in case of the children or adenosine, even after application of the adenosine, the tachycardia terminates, but again, within few seconds or minutes, it again starts. Again terminates, again starts. Even after the DC shock, the tachycardia terminates, again starts. That is this type of tachycardia, the incessant tachycardia. This is particularly happens in case of the PZRT, parenchymal junctional GNT tachycardia. And this is one of the example of the tachycardia. And these are the differential diagnosis point. But if adenosine does not work, DC shock does not work, it is more likely this is the PZRT, paroxysmal junctional GNT tachycardia. As because this is, we are not always thinking this type of the tachycardia, as because this is unusual form of the AVRT, where the retrograde path is very slow. As because it is very slow, so the location of the POF is just before the next QRS operation. If the retrograde path is, should be faster, the POF should be here. But if the retrograde path is slower, so POF location is here. So this is the unusual form of the AVRT. And this is the commonest cause of the incessant tachycardia in children and the adolescent. And re-entry is the mechanism and less responsive to the adenosine. And this is the one of the common example that gives rise to the development of the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. But we are not considering differential diagnosis in adult as because this is not a common tachycardia. So it is uh, less, that is we think it, when these kinds of the characteristics we can see, that is, it does not respond to the tachycardia, but this is not unusual, this may happen. So this is one of the examples of the long RP tachycardia, and these are the characteristics of the PZRT that is considered in case of the long RP tachycardia. And in case of the junctional tachycardia, not always, this is the re-entry tachycardia. This is the uh, example of the, what we mean by the AV junction. This is the common thing we should consider atrioventricular junction, what do you mean by this? That is atrioventricular junction means the AV node, that is atrioventricular junction has got the three parts. The atrial part here, that is the middle part of the compact AV node, and the distal part. So all these structures are, all these structures are considered the AV node, that is atrioventricular junction. And this tachycardia from here, sometimes they give rise to this kinds of the, that is perusable junctional tachycardia and not always, most of the time, the rhythm from here, the junctional escape rhythm, that is 40 to 60 beats per minute. This is the inherent junctional, that is a rate, that is a junctional escape rhythm like this. This is the junctional rhythm, and this is the normal rhythm of the junction is because this is the rate, it is about 40, and this is the location of the POF just after the QRS complex. So this is the junctional escape rhythm. This is not the take of the pericardia, but when the rate goes above the 60, this is called the accelerated junctional tachycardia. This is tachycardia for, he, for this kind of the rhythm. As because its inherent rate is 60, so more than 60 is accelerated. But when the rate goes beyond more than the 100, then it's called the junctional tachycardia. So the junctional rhythm can be from either parts of these three parts of the AV node. And these are the examples of the rhythm, what can be arises from this kind of the tachycardia. But not always. This is the re-entry tachycardia. Sometimes it is the junctional rhythm, sometimes it is the accelerated junctional rhythm, or sometimes it is the accelerated junctional rhythm, or sometimes it can be the junctional tachycardia. And this junctional tachycardia, either it may be automatic or it can be paroxysmal. And this paroxysmal the automatic usually does not fulfill the criteria of the re-entry. And as it does not fulfill the criteria of the re-entry, this is the reason why it does not respond to the adenosine. 
So long RP trigadia, non ROS positive adenosine gives rise to the suspicion of the PJRT. And PJRT is the trigadia that is arises from the atrioventricular junctional, uh, junctional area. And this is another example of the supraventricular trigadia. That is the regular white complex trigadia. So this is the example of the white complex trigadia. Supraventricular trigadia may be presented with this type of the ECG. And in case of the supraventricular tachycardia, most of the time it is due to the average of the QRS morphology. And average of the QRS morphology either may be functional because of the partial refractory phase of the either of the pathways, usually the right pathway as it is the narrower than the left pathway. This is not the anatomical block or two anatomical block may be present. There is the two anatomical block may be either in the right bundle branch or left bundle branch. So, Supraventricular tachycardia again may be presented with this type of the ECG that is regular white complex tachycardia. I will not discuss this issue as because white complex tachycardia will be discussed by Dr. Rufi Ahmed in uh, this Saturday uh, that is uh, on the 12, that is 19th of this month. So this is the very important topics that is differential diagnosis of the white complex tachycardia. This is a topic for our Rufi Ahmed sir. That, that will be happening just after the Saturday afternoon. So I'll not discuss this issue. So these are the examples of the different kinds of the supraventricular tachycardia. So ECG is not the only means to diagnose the supraventricular tachycardia. There are other means. That is the pharmacological means, as I have discussed, like the adenosine, or there will be some vagal maneuvers. That also helps to differential diagnose that, super, that is the supraventricular tachycardia. Or, some, uh, or sometimes you use the pacing maneuvers Unlike is the pacing variables in the EP lab, we cannot differentiate, we cannot uh, definitely diagnose the supraventricular tachycardia. So ECG is not the final means. We should not consider this is the only way for uh, clean cut, confirmed diagnosis of the supraventricular tachycardia. Many of the times we need these types of the help. So this is not the ECG that will give all types of the answer, but ECG is very much important for the uh, differential diagnosis and initial, that is, index of suspicion for the differential diagnosis of that. But most of the times it is possible to uh, diagnose the super, what types of the superventricular. But sometimes, this, not always, this is, the, this is the examples in few cases. So, in summary, supraventricular tachycardia is a very common arrhythmia. Its prevalence is nearly 35 per 100,000 people. So, this is not uncommon tachycardia. And very interesting. This is a disease of the healthy people. Actually, most of the healthy people are presented in this case of the tachycardia. And another important information, this most of the time, this is a curable disease. So we should diagnose it. This is the reason we should diagnose clearly the, this type of the tachycardia. So we should not avoid the diagnosis of this tachycardia. But this is not all about this tachycardia. There are many things to know and more in the next time. Thank you very much for your kind participation. Thank you. Thank you, Atar Bhai. I think with each lecture, I come to understand the how little lecture I do <laughs> each time. Sometimes I get a little bit depressed. There's so many factors, so many information. Uh, can I remember all that? But the most important thing is perhaps treatment-wise for a group, certain type of uh, tachycardia, you uh, take up a certain type of treatment, you achieve the success. And then analyze which type of tachycardia it was. Uh, sir, there, are, sir, there are good number of questions. Uh, some of them are being already answered by Dr. Afik Ahmed, sir. Should I repeat these questions, sir? Why not? Uh, this is Okay. Okay, sir. Sir, one question from Dr. Rehan. In atrial fibrillation, no P wave, but how P rate calculated? Atar, sir. I think, um, uh, I think, uh, Rupi Kavit sir is here, sir. No, Atar, please answer that. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. Actually, uh, the fibrillated wave, uh, the, it is difficult, but sometimes we can see, not always, the fibrillatory wave may be the very fine fibrillatory waves or the 
coarse fibrillatory wave. This is not always possible to calculate the rate of the fibrillatory wave, but sometimes it is possible if the fibrillators are organized. That is, it is depends on the morphology of the fibrillatory wave, whether it is very fine, if it is very fine and difficult to see, then it is not possible. But if it is organized, then we can calculate the fibril that is the rate of the tachycardia. And as these are not regular, so we should calculate the number of the waves in 10 seconds or like this, then we can multiply this time interval into the, uh, convert it into the 60 seconds. This is the way we can consider that is a, that is a, by calculate the number of the fibrillatory waves. But this is not always possible if we cannot see the fibrillatory waves clearly. Can I add something? Yes. Nice. Actually, when we say the P wave here, we do not mean the sinus P wave. Any actual depolarization wave, we call it P wave. But is it sinus P wave? Is it junctional P wave? Is it flutter wave? Actually, we mean that it's the actual depolarization wave. That's what actually Adar Bhai was saying. And you can only uh, assume the rate if this is coarse actual fibrillation. Otherwise, fine actual fibrillation is very difficult. And only the EP persons like you can actually determine that from the uh, uh, study. Yes, it can be determined from intracardiac tracing. Cardiac electrocardiac. Easily it is um, countable, but uh, from surfaces it is very difficult to count the rates. True, true, true. Yes. Lovic said, do you want to comment on that? No, I think uh, Jamil and Atar answered the question. And there is no point of even trying. I mean, intracardiac, we can, but the rate is so fast. The rate varies between 500 to 700 bits per minute. Um, so um, once it is actual fibrillation, there is no point of saying that um, P wave rate is such and such. Yeah. I Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question. If in atrial flutter with 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1 conduction, QRS complex rate is less than 100, is it tachycardia? In a patient oh. with atrial flutter, with 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1, the atrial rate is more than 100, but the ventricular rate is less than 100. Should we call it tachycardia? So, so it is by definition, this is the atrial tachycardia. This is the atrial tachycardia is because this is atrial flutter is an example of the atrial tachycardia where the flutter rate is more than 100, usually 300 plus minus 50. But the ventricular response may not fulfill the criteria of the tachycardia is because ventricular response may be depending upon the block in the AV node. As for example, if it is 2 is to 1, it may be 150. It is 3 is to 1, like this. So it should not be mentioned that it is tachycardia. It is atrial flutter. You, you should just mention it is atrial flutter with this type of the ratio. That is either fixed block like this 2 is to 1, 3 is to 1, or 4 is to 1, or the variable block like this. And again, you can uh, some uh, add the adjective like this, the ventricular response is fast or ventricular response is slow. So. Uh, I think this term is not applicable for the ventricular rate. This term is applicable for the atrial rate. That is the flutter rate that fulfills the criteria of the take area. That is the more than 100 and it is 300 plus minus 50. Actually, when we say take cardia or uh, bradycardia, we actually mean uh, according to the ventricular rate. That's important for our clinical context. But for the etiology, for the ECG, we do not mean that atrial uh, uh, take cardia. We call that Atrial tachycardia means the rate is high and this from atrial rate is high, particularly from the atria. Flutter rate is also high from uh, atria. Fibrillation rate is high from atria. But ventricular rate, we mentioned it uh, separately. And he is very right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, as we say in case of atrial fibrillation, the AF, AF with first ventricular rate, AF with uh, normal rate, AF with slow ventricular rate. That's like, like. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rafik, sir, uh, do you want to add anything, sir? Yeah, no, I'm fine with that. But there's a, a question about electrical alternance. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I I'm coming to add that. Yes. Sir, uh, there's a question by Dr. Kurmi. Uh, features of Mahim fiber tachycardia. Atar, sir, do you want to answer this question? Yeah, actually, uh, this is the issue that will be discussed in the late lecture that is about the accessory pathways. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Oh, yeah. Um, that. Uh, another question by Dr. Rehan. Long RP means more than 80 milliseconds or more? No, 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 no. What does exactly long RP means? No, no. Long RP means that is the, that is the, that is the, it is the interval from the uh, previous QRS to P and the P to the next QRS. QRS. It is the yes. ratio between these two. 
the p wave may be at the middle part of the both qrs complex there is rp may be that is at the mid part of the qrs complex that is a, a rp may be equal to the pr so it is a uh, that is a uh, that is a it is a ratio that is a r to p and the p to r so this is the way how to differentiate with the long rp and the short rp if the r to p is longer then it is called the long rp but most of the time except in case of the sinus tachycardia and atrial tachycardia the p before the next qrs is inverted and this implies most of the if it is inverted you are happy that is it is not the sinus tachycardia this is the retrograde p wave either may be avrt atypical avrt or the atrial tachycardia if the p wave is inverted particularly in case of the lead 2 so but when it is p wave is uh, positive particularly in case of the lead 2 and just before the tachycardia by definition this is example of the long rp tachycardia and sinus tachycardia is the best example sometimes atrial tachycardia may happen so it is the r to p and p to r thank you sir uh, in avrt p always negative or it may be positive also avrt p in avrt is p always negative or it may be positive also as so most of the time as because avrt Uh, this yes, is, this is also uh, will be discussed in the next session but in case of the avrt the tachycardia may be antidromic or orthodromic orthodromic means the anti grade pathway from the atrium to the ventricle through the normal conduction system and the retrograde pathway from ventricle to the atrium that is from below upwards that is retrograde way from ventricle to the atrium that is the retrograde pathway so in this case their p must be must be the inverted that is the negative so in case of the orthodromic avrt it must be uh, negative but in case of the antidromic if it can be seen yes there may be it can be positive but most of the time the uh, presentation of the avrt is orthodromic mary qrs and the t is inverted classically thank you sir uh, dr rehan just make a comment sir sir brief comment so yes sir what arthur said i'm just going to make it little simple if the reentrant circuit and the activation of the atrium is coming from below that means either from av node reentry or atrioventricular reentry the electrical signal will move from inferior part of the atrium to the top part so the leads that are going to be negative will be leads 2 3 avf yeah. in yeah. all cases in other situation it will be variable like athar showed in ecg possible left Lateral electricity pathway. In that case, it will be negative in V6, but the, all these reentrant tachycardia plus an inferior atrial tachycardia will have negative P wave in leads two, three AVF. Please do not confuse it with negative in all leads. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor Rehan uh, asked a question. We, he he confuses P wave that is inverted P wave with T wave frequently. How we can differentiate these two things? the p wave after r wave which is often inverted and it is confusing with t wave how to differentiate this p wave and t wave yes. i answer that yes sir yes sir i will be happy sir yeah as i am get i get confused too so the answer <laughs> is yes <laughs> so I, I, it, the, the whole point is that you come up with a presumptive diagnosis like if the p wave is really overlapping on the t wave you can't see it i mean you can be the best scholar best electrophysiologist in the world but you will not see it you cannot make something like so yes it, it, this is confusing for all of us what we try to do is other showed in cg where in v4 v5 v6 there is some distortion of the st segment and he made an assumption that was the p wave and the way we find the p wave is we see we look at multiple tracing see yes i can see it all the time it's not an artifact that's what it is and then you i get confused too i'm sure all of us get confused yes sir thank you thank you sir uh, dr hirwal i mean asked when we tell paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia what is the definition of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia as paroxysmal means that is the onset of the tachycardia is sudden all on a sudden that sudden onset and the tachycardia how much that is uh, how long it will uh, persist that is not the question 
when it terminates it is again suddenly that is sudden starts sudden cut this is the characteristic of the peroxidase virus so peroxidase virus take it usually this is also a criteria for the reentry when the peroxidase virus criteria fulfills the mechanism is usually the reentry take it not always there is some automatic take it as per example the peroxidase virus junctional reentry take it without reentry mechanism this may happen but most of the time classically this is the reentry mechanism and sudden start sudden off this is the characteristic of the peroxidase take it thank you sir uh, is it possible that avrt becomes white complex tachycardia yes avrt both avrt and event but most uh, most of the time it is the avrt then the yes, avnrt sir. that can produce the rate related bundle branch block aberration yes bundle branch block aberration is not uncommon in case of the supraventricular tachycardia and it constitutes 15% of all the wide complex tachycardia that will be discussed in the lake, next lecture by us sir so yes supraventricular tachycardia may be presented with the wide complex tachycardia and it is most commoner in avrt than the AV, that is avrt than the avrt sir please thank you sir na thank you sir um so, to uh, me there there, there is a there is a question like slow or fast pathway is it genetically determined present in all patient or only in pathological condition so i think uh, i will uh, happy uh, rubika will sir answer to this question but initially i will to talk as because i have shown in the lecture sir as because uh, if we if we analyze these kinds of the physiology in the ep lab it can be observed in nearly about 35% of the population but all the population having these kinds of the dual physiology this is the physiological concept then the anatomical concept but there is some anatomical consideration as because what i have shown in the uh, location of the uh, av node and the upper part shows the location of the fast pathway and the lower part is the uh, slow pathway but the concept is more physiological than the anatomical and this concept that is this kind of the physiology may be observed in, in up to 35% of the population but not all population have it this kinds of the physiology will develop the supraventricular tachycardia sir if we uh, uh, can i add something other way uh, yes yeah, sure it is more uh, congenital than genetic oh yes congenital it's, than the acquired it's right? congenital not genetic congenitally yes. there is a slow and fast pathway and it is physiological no doubt there is no definite um, histological difference of the cells around the av node uh, but it's not genetic profic sir uh, yes I, 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 i precisely the point that dr jamil made we have to be careful when we use the term genetic genetic hmm. will be long qt syndrome that means if a patient has that they can pass it on to their children hmm. av nodal dual physiology is the electrical phenomena I, whether it's anatomic or not, that's a different story. But it is not genetic. People are born with it, um, and that's what uh, we are trying to emphasize. Thank you, sir. Uh, a question from Dr. Shahidul Bogra: uh, How to manage the case of recurrent SBT in CCU when adenosine fails? Uh, Atar, sir. Yes, uh, when adenosine fails, that. Uh, again uh, we have to review the diagnosis of this case particularly as i have shown as because there are some kinds of the tachycardia adenosine fails means in case of the narrow complex tachycardia it may not be the av nodal dependent supraventricular tachycardia there are other alternative diagnosis we have to consider as because although it looks like the supraventricular tachycardia it may be atrial fata it may be atrial tachycardia or it may be the paroxysmal junctional reentry tachycardia and this kind of the tachycardia usually does not respond uh, quite well to this uh, adenosine the they respond but again they can start the tachycardia so we have to review the diagnosis again but if the patient is clinically unstable hemodynamically unstable we have to think about the non pharmacological maneuver particularly the cardio version for the immediate safety of the patient so if adenosine does not respond we have to think even the administration of the adenosine whether it is in the proper way or not this is also a point we have to consider so these are the things we have to rethink when the adenosine fails to terminate the tachycardia 
very rapid otherwise it is not going to work it's uh, yeah. half life is very short okay so, so I think is... suddenly it should yeah. be this... pushed to the intervenous and flushed with saline okay this is this is the point i think dr jamil is is making a very very important point is the common reason of failure of adenosine is how we inject it the the half life of the medicine is 9 seconds yes so let's say i have connected a iv syringe to iv line i inject the adenosine i take that syringe off then put another syringe and flush it i have actually crossed 9 seconds Yes, what okay. I do, what I do is, first of all, put a three-way stop cord. Yes. So in one syringe, there is 20 cc or 50 cc of flush. The other syringe is the adenosine. So you inject the adenosine and turn the quickly and then flush it fast. The other trick that we do is we lift the arm of the patient to make the drainage first. So if six milligram doesn't work, we give uh, 12 milligram. A maximum we rarely give 18 milligram. Now, once we give that, two things will happen. One, if it is a reentrant circuit, a true ventricular reentry or AV node reentry, there will be block in the AV node and it will stop the tachycardia, most likely. If it is atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter with one to one conduction, it will block the AV node and we'll be able to see the flutter wave. And in that case, there is no point of trying it again. If the SVT is stopped, and start it again, I may try one more time to see if it works. If then it does not work. Let's say I have given adenosine, patient came back to SVT again after two minutes. I give second dose of adenosine, it comes back to SVT after two minutes. Am I going to give electric shock to that patient? Yes, I can. But if I do the electric shock, it will come back again. So then I will have to think of something that works. So I can put the patient on intravenous delta IgM drip. I can be careful about the blood pressure. Extremely rarely, extremely rarely, if the patient is very sick, let's say somebody with septic shock, recurrent SVT, with a systolic pressure of 90 millimeter of mercury. And I gave adenosine, it stopped, it came back. Or I gave um, electric shock, it came back. The only drug that you can start in intravenous amiodarone, because amiodarone will not change the blood pressure too much, unless we give it bolus. So rarely, extremely rarely, we, we will use the intravenous. So the sequence wise, first adenosine, if after adenosine there is recurrence of the SVT quickly, um, there is no point of trying to shock. I think we will have to then give intravenous delta as um, and then consider amiodarone. Uh, and the other thing is that if, of course, Athar mentioned that if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then of course, uh, there is only one treatment of choice, which is electrical shock treatment. Please remember that you will not want to be shocked when you are awake. So please try to call anesthesia department and sedate the patient and then give electric shock. That's very, very important. Thank you, sir. Um, next question. Uh, why electrical alternance occurs in FRT? Yeah, I wanted to touch that point. Very, yes, I, I, what I do, I cannot remember things if I don't understand it. So electrical alternance is a vague phenomena and the typical time that we find is in pericardial effusion. Why? Because the heart is floating in this fluid and it is changing direction, flip-flopping, and it's called rocking of the heart. And you get one QRS small, one QRS longer. Why will that happen in SVT? Nobody knows the mechanism. And also, why is it seen more in atrioventricular reentry than avenod reentry? So what they have said that maybe it is possible, I just imagine Athar's picture, that there is an accessory pathway on the left side of the heart. So electrical signal went back through the left side, came through the atrium and going down through the avenod. And that patient by any chance had a dual electrical system and that goes through the slow pathway. Next time the signal comes, goes through the fast pathway. 
And the way it, this theory came about is if you carefully look at those electrical alternates, you will find that there is some variation in the RR interval. So that is the mechanism that has been postulated that maybe this patient have dual physiology, it will one signal goes to the fast pathway, conduct to the QRS, another slow pathway, they will not. And that's why we see it more commonly in atrial ventricular reentry and atrial tachycardia rather than AV node reentry. So these are all theories. Uh, it will be very, very tough, but the, this alternation in RR interval, you can actually map it. If you look at the ECG that Arthur showed, and if you measure it, you may find that there is some variation in RR interval of the ECG. Uh, Thank you, sir. There are... What is the highest level of ventricular rate in sinus tachycardia, sir? In case of the flows, in case of the yes, sinus tachycardia, that is, we can see what is happening in case of the uh, treadmill test. There is the maximum yes, sinus rate we calculate. There is a uh, there is a 220 minus the age. So theoretically, usually it does not happen, but theoretically it is possible that is the sinus may, rate maybe goes up to that level. That is the age minus. Uh, that is a 220 minus the age. This can be, but usually it is a. Uh, uh, but uh, without without uh, during the stress test, normally, physiologically, it is not the rate. So I think upper rate. Uh, I don't know what is the answer, and Rubisal may add something. But the maximum rate can be what we see in case of the stress test. There is 220 minus the age. That is the maximum predicted rate for an individual person. Is the chronotomy uh -huh. response is okay, sir? No, I think you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, during treadmill, we take patients to 100%, 110% people who are athletic. You, you can go to 110% of um, age prediction maximal heart rate. So there is no limit to that. Um, so by rate itself, we cannot differentiate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the questions by left-hand colon Nizam. What is the treatment of paroxysmal junctional reentry tachycardia? As it is refractory adenosine and DC shock. I think, uh, Atasad, do you want to make any comment on this? Yes, that is the uh, most of the time it is difficult, even pharmacologically and even uh, that is uh, by the ablation. This is a very difficult type of the arrhythmia to treat. But still, it is the ablation that is a treatment of choice that is a uh, that is a Ablation is a treatment of choice for the, uh, uh, that is a curative treatment of choice for this uh, paroxysmal junctional reentry tachycardia. But this is always a very difficult tachycardia to treat. But this is the treatment of choice. Usually, drug works very little to this type of the tachycardia. Uh, regarding sinus tachycardia, there is a, a good question or comment by Dr. Ajay Dotto. Why 220 is the magic number of maximum sinus tachycardia in uh, ETT or in other cases we use the term number 220? Why it is 220? Mm. please. I, no, no idea. I don't know why they came that number. What from. Uh, what would make it? What would make it? Master of this question. <laughs> and I could not find it. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to ask the question, but instead we assume that uh, most of the time sinus tachycardia do not exceed most of the time do not exceed 160 usual scenario, except in treadmill. So uh, whenever it crosses 140, you have to be cautious whether it is actually a flutter with twist to one conduction uh, or uh, it is sinus tachycardia that we have to be uh, taking care of. Uh, one thing is that, for example, in a uh, junction at Parkinson's tachycardia, if you, it, it, it's very difficult. What track are you going to use, Arthur, bhai? So I, I, I want to comment about yes, this, yes, sir. PJRT. PJRT is uncommon in adults. Yeah. It is more common in pediatric patient post-surgery. Yes. So it is more common in post post cardiac surgery in pediatric. In adults, when we call PGRT, we have to be careful that whether we are missing AV node reentry or not. It is possible that it's AV node reentry and we cannot see that treatment wise, if you look at the junction, AV node is calcium current dependent. And if you want to choose a benign medication, it will be a calcium channel blocker. If you look at the AV node, um, the 
there is some effect of the beta blocker. So we can try beta blocker, we can try calcium channel blocker. And then as Atar mentioned that if all those fail, uh, let's say somebody is 85 year old or close to 90 year old um, in this country or in Bangladesh, 75, 80 year old. And we believe that is really paroxysmal junctional tachycardia. And I have a choice, nothing works. I have a choice between amiodarone and going for an EPA and ablation. Because what would happen with PJRT that if once we try to ablate this patient, I am actually ablating the junction. There is high likelihood that these patients will end up in heart block. So the choice would be, am I going to take that risk or take the risk of a side effect of a drug like amiodarone? And these are a thinking process that we have to consider. First, we have to confirm that this is a junctional tachycardia without any re-entering circuit. It's not even not re-entering tachycardia that is we are missing. So those are all the options that will, but I, in general, in my practice, I mean, we rarely see this paroxysmal, pure paroxysmal junctional tachycardia in adults. So one of the comment by Dr. Rohan is, uh, should we use CV line for adenosine injection? So do you have oh, the, qu it? the question is, oh, so, so let's look at the scenario. A 32 year old man comes to the emergency room. He is having palpitation. Blood pressure is 110 over 60. And I am that patient. And you want to put a central line in me? <laughs> Question to, will you, as a physician, I have to ask myself that if you say that I'm the best person who can put central line and I'm going to put a central line in you, do you think I'm going to agree to that? Absolutely not. No, Thank on the you. other hand, if somebody is needing a central line for something else and there is already an existing central line, I will use that central line to inject it, but then I will reduce the dose by half. So we have to be careful. So no, I will not put a central line just for that. Yeah, for, mm -hmm. I think for any procedure that we do, I ask myself, every time I go to the room, I look at my patient, look at how, how many lines hanging from the patient's body. And I ask, am I going to use any of these lines today? If the answer is no, I'll take it out. Because the more line we put in any patient, the more infection risk that is. And this is actually one of the commonest cause of hospital acquired infection, all these lines that we put in patients. Actually, the misplaced central line is one of the cause of atrial arrhythmias. Because if it goes down below, it will irritate the right atrium and cause some arrhythmia as well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we have got Professor Mohsin Hoshin with us. Uh, uh, to Dr. Mohsin Hoshin, please answer. What are the prophylactic drugs for recurrent SBT and when we should refer a patient of SBT to, for ablation? Prophylaxis is mainly narrow complex tachycardia. If the patient does not have a documented atrial fibrillation, a choice of long-term prophylaxis is usually Malpamil, uh, Diltiazim, beta blocker. These are the commonly drug we can use with for long-term prophylaxis. So if the patient has a recurrent symptom, then <coughs> the patient needs uh, ablation. If the patient has minimum symptom once a year, but twice a year, then we can patient and patient and hypertension, we can keep this patient on uh, drugs. So we shouldn't refer uh, on the first time to for ablation? On the first counter? No, first, first time usually, if the first time the access pathway in the, uh, and patient are high risk group, that is the patient is, uh, that is uh, diaper, patient is, uh, what is called? Uh, high risk profession. Work, high risk profession, then we can ablate this patient. Otherwise we can keep it here. Let's see. Let's uh, see. I, I, I want to add one thing. Yeah. First time attack and the patient lost consciousness is an indication for ablation. Another thing is uh, uh, if um, it is uh, in case of AVRT, if it is antidromic, then first attack is an indication for ablation. Rafik said, do you want to add 
anything sir well, it, it, this is a very very important question let's say i i am in the office and this patient comes and tells me he is 35 year old first episode of supraventricular tachycardia he went to the emergency room he got adenosine and he was sent home on delta azm 120 mg daily what am i going to do um this patient has uh, did not pass out minimally symptomatic first thing i'm going to do i'm going to stop the medicine yes because he he waited 35 years for his first episode it may be another 35 years before he gets his second episode yes. now this patient goes home comes back after 3 months with another episode of svt and at that point i have to make a decision that now i need to treat this patient and that will be that is the point that we are going to make decision whether we send the patient for ablation or medication. Now, interestingly, that patient also had hypertension. So he needs the medicine anyway. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put a calcium child blocker and send him home. He comes back again after three months with another episode of SVT. Now it is time to consider ablation or increase the dose of the medicine. Um, here in America, 20 years ago, we insisted that they fail at least one or two medicines. Now we do not, we give patients choice. But remember, even in the best hand in the world, there will be hard block with avinodri and tachycardia ablation, one in 200. And that we must remember that. So a clinical scenario, so not only ablation, the question is whether the patient needs medical treatment at all or not. Now, let's say that patient that I sent home without any medicine comes back after five years another episode of SVT. What am I going to do? I'm going to send him home again because go and wait for five years, it will come back again. Because if I treat him with medicine, I will have to wait for five years before I know the treatment work, whether it is ablation or medication. So these are the important points that we have to consider. Um, one of the things that we do when you send these patients home, we make sure that the patient can reach me. So I tell them, call my office if you have a problem, and then we'll take care of you. Please remember one thing that the, if I'm a patient, I'll be very anxious. And if a physician says, you can call my office um, and I'll get back to you. And if I really do that, it's a big, big comfort for the patient. And I think that is important that we are giving support, psychological support to the patient that he said, look, I'm not lost. I have patients who travel out of the country and I tell them, if you get SVT in Germany, call me. I have friends in Germany. If they go to Bangladesh, I tell them the same thing. You go to Bangladesh, you have a problem, call me, and then I will find you a doctor there because it will be easier for me to find a doctor. So whole point is the compassion and proper caring. Thank you. Are you going to do the question, question answers? Uh, uh, there are a lot of questions, but I think we should move to the next session, the okay. interactive ECG session by Dr. Rafik Ahmed, sir. Uh, sir, you can start. The, by the time you share, you are sharing your skin, a quick comment on a question, well, how to differentiate sinoatrial uh, re-entry tachycardia and sinus tachycardia? Atta, sir. I think, uh, Firoz, okay, we, we can go for, we can go for think, the next uh, during, uh, during the ECG, we can discuss the issue, but already Sarah shared the screen. I think we should okay, concentrate. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. sir. okay. okay. So the, uh, we, my point focus is to look at ECGs that are relevant to the lectures, but please don't, please remember, uh, patients don't come to us with announcements. So I'm going to, I may change topics. I, my ECGs today will also touch into the situation where we uh, have computer generated ECGs. Sometimes they are correct, sometimes they are not. And it will, so uh, first question and the answer for answer and, uh, and discussion will be Professor Odut for this lecture. So this is the patient. And I think we have um, the um, computer system today. Choice of one, uh, two, three, four. Yes, sir. A, B, C, D, sir. Oh, one, two, three, four. Right. It's one, fine. Two, you can call A, B, C, D. Yes. One will be A. Sarek. Kamrul, bhai. Sir. Pol, pol, chalu karen, pol. So instead of one, two, three, four, please use A, B, C, D.
and Firoz will keep time. Please. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, I think we have crossed 30 seconds time. And... Sir, it started. Sir, it started, sir. Oh, now we start now? Okay. Sir, I'm going to say, sir, I'm going to stop. Uh, okay, uh, dear attendants, please go for the uh, uh, comments again by A, B, C, D. Those who have already made comment, make uh, the choice again. Thirty second over, sir. Thirty second over, sir. Please stop, please stop, stop. Okay. Can we should answer? You can stop now. You can stop now, and give us the result. Full most result. Of the, most of the result. Forty-seven percent is C, nineteen uh, percent <laughs> A, nine percent B, and twenty-six percent D. Well, Highest my plan is was. Okay, my plan was that I will say, "What well, do you are hundred percent successful, and you will be hundred percent somewhere." <laughs> so I leave this. Uh, for discussion to uh, Professor Wadud, because uh, he talked about uh, ST segment. Look at the CCG. This is a 30 year old male. Three days of constant non exertional chest pain. Is it MI? If it is MI, three days old, there should be prominent key web. It's not there. So the number two is out. Number one is normal ECG. Well, if it is normal ECG, the patient has a problem. Why the patient has a problem? We should look for something else. So logically, norm, normal uh, ECG should not be considered. Number three is pericarditis. And four is early repolarization. Young men presenting with a slight ST elevation could be, but look at the ST elevation distribution. It's presenting multiple leads many where. And whatever the if his pericarditis has a choice, look at the PR segment in lead two, it's slightly depressed from the TP segment. Look at the PR segment in FER, is slightly elevated. What is paid ST changes? Elevation not typical of MI, not really limited to a simple arterial territory, associated with PR segment depression in inferior leads and elevation in FER is going to be, in this scenario, pericarditis. But Thank really, you. I think, sir? Yeah, this is a classic ECG for pericarditis because you have all the features, PR segment depression, diffuse ST elevation, um, and um, PR elevation in AVR, and some sinus, like a little bit of uh, high risk. Sir, is high there ST depression in lead three? Yeah, but remember that only lead three, single lead, do not represent a, uh, any definitive diagnosis. You have to have the similar change at least in two contiguous leads. That criteria is not fulfilled. Not three AVF, not two AVF, two, two, three. So only three. So okay. we have. Sir, sir, what are the points against early repolarization pattern? The scenario at number one. The diffuse distribution, number two, the PR segment change that's present in here. That's the point. These two are the plausible causes. Thank you. This pericarditis has more winning point. So we are going for pericarditis. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next one. Um, yes, sir. OK. So this is a 79-year-old female. Um, I have written the heart rate there. Um, it's uh, 120 something. Yes. You can stop now, it's 30 seconds. Show us the result. 
sir, fifty percent says it is C, and seventeen percent A, seventeen percent B, seventeen percent D. Yeah, this is unique unique result. So no, I, A, I B, D, all seventeen percent. Yeah, it is it is fair. I, I think that's that's pretty fair uh, answer. So question would be, um, I'll leave it to Atahar to discuss this ECG. I did not put a clinical scenario. The heart rate was 121, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. sir Atta, sir, uh, please. Sir, it is the regular narrow QRS tachycardia. Yes. We can see the P wave before East QRS complex, but yes. the PR interval is nearly about 200 millisecond. The PR is particularly biphasic in lead two. And it is negative in V1, and the P1 is also negative in case of the lateral leads, particularly V4, V5, and V6. Yeah. So my differential diagnosis, what we have written is that the atrial tachycardia, sinus tachycardia. First of all, I want to exclude the sinus tachycardia, as because the PO morphology lead two does not looks like the sinus morphology, particularly in case of the lead two. This is not the sinus morphology. So from lead two, looking at the P morphology. I can exclude the sinus tachycardia. Then SVT with AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. The P wave location does not support this diagnosis, sir, as because yeah. the P wave is just in between. That is the uh, uh, that is the it is the just short RP tachycardia than the long RP tachycardia. This is definitely we should consider, but it is uh, by the location of the P wave it is not uh, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Again, yes, it can be one of the differential diagnosis for the atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. Yes. The first of all, finally, sir, AVRT and the atrial tachycardia are the most two important things we have to consider. But because of the location of the P wave, biphasic P wave in lead two, the negative P wave in V5, V6, I will consider the atrial tachycardia first over the atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, sir. Okay. I, I, I think, I think what, all the diagnosis. Yeah, go ahead. Rate, rate is 120 only. Yes, so the rate is 120. Sometimes we see some slow SVT, atrial tachycardia, but I think all these are possible diagnoses. I mean, yeah. best would be if I see this patient in telemetry floor, and if the heart rate is constant at 121, then I will say this is not sinus tachycardia. That will be the clue. Yeah. Technical scenario of the patient, but other than that, any of those diagnoses I will take. If you look at the P wave, I'm thinking that maybe in lead V1, I'm pointing the arrow. This is the terminal negative component of the P wave in V1. So maybe it looks like that. In lead three or two, if you look at lead three, the T wave is inverted or I, I can't tell which is whether it's negative or positive. It, which is distorting what? But if I assume this is positive P wave, so I think the possibilities are all of those possibilities. Sinus tachycardia with first degree AV block. Atrial tachycardia with a first degree AV block. And if we not reentrant tachycardia, atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, all those are equal possibilities. And I think there is a reason for showing this. And if you look at this is the um, August 8th and next same day, a um, little later, look at this. So this patient has baseline first degree AV block. Yes. And if you look at lead V1, it's a biphasic and that superimposed on the, and the lead two, the funny looking. So basically that was sinus tachycardia with first degree AV block. And the point we are trying to make here to all the audience that is in, none of us was correct. And so that's what medicine is all about. I will look at the clinical scenario of the patient, but I think telemetry monitoring would be the main clue to this patient, not the single point ECG. And I will never put this ECG in an exam to determine whether the, my student is competent or incompetent to read ECGs. This will be an ECG that will be for discussion because if I give this ECG to 10 cardiologists, they will answer all those answers that you have given me today. Thank you. So next one, this is a, a 61 year old a male and this is the ECG and the computer generated ECG reporting is there also.
কামরুল ভাই পোলটা অন করেন পোলটা এসি থেকে ঢেকে দেয় এটা একটা মুশকিল হ্যাঁ ওই দূরে সরানো আচ্ছা এই পোলটা পোলটা কে দিয়ে সরানো যা পোলটা মাইনাস করা স্যার রেখে স্ক্রিন থেকে সরানো যা ইচ্ছা করলে ছে ক্লিক করে ড্র্যাগ করা যায় good. I think... Uh, uh, <laughs> this is fantastic i mean if we look at this the computer reported a sinus with the much short pr interval first of all it measured the pr interval totally wrong there is a p wave in lit 2 and if i measure the pr interval it's about 160 millisecond but the p wave here is negative and my first reflex was this is an ectopic atrial rhythm but if we look carefully look at lit 3 there is a p wave and there is another one so this is basically is the atrial flutter it's a slow atypical atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction and if i took another diagnosis i would have taken probably ectopic atrial rhythm if i missed that that is it thank you i think this is fantastic um, so the same patient um, i'll i'll go go to the ecg next you see when it goes to sinus rhythm the p wave morphology totally changes and I think that's why it's important always to look, find the old ECG um, to, to compare the rhythm. Next one. So one question. <laughs> yes. Regarding the previous ECG, the yes. point of such a rhythm disturbance, should we look at the long QT that gives confusion? What could uh, uh, audience was asking? In the long QT here? In the previous this is yes. Yeah. So the, if you look at the QT interval, it's about 460 milliseconds. Computer yes. actually measured it pretty good. And then you correct it, it comes up long. The yeah. problem with the correction is that when the heart rate is, it is so much variable, it's a, it's a little bit prolonged QT. And that, of course, will make it confusing because the other prob problem is, is this QT long because there is a super impulse? Uh, I don't think so. The Q P wave is a little earlier than that. So yeah, there is, there is a minimum. I'm, I'm going to report that as prolonged QT. A clinical significance, I don't know. And also it depends on which formula is being used. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the multiple formulas come up with different kind of numbers. Okay, this one. Next is this one. Let's give them 20 seconds and then let's yes, put sir. up the poll. Yes, sir. Uh, the poll is Yes, sir. It could be The heart rate is around 100. Now, I'll give you the heart rate. The poll. Is about, heart, rate is about, heart rate is about 114 uh, beats per minute. Taking, we can stop now. Show us the result. Yeah. Oh, so seventy-five percent. It is D. D. Uh, two percent A, fourteen percent B, and nine percent C. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I'll just talk in favor of who answered B. When I first saw this ECG, it crossed my mind because if you look at the P and look at the T, it looks like there are maybe, may, is it flatter? It's, but then, of course, the reason I put the inferior infarct diagnosis was there is a QA pattern, QS pattern. However, if you look in lead V4, V5, V6, you can clearly see the delta wave. You can remove so the full box. Yes, and then 
if you, um, when the rate slows down, it becomes much better. Yes. See, less pre-excitation, um, but you can clearly see now, this is basically a debt of sinus tachycardia with WPW syndrome. Thank you. It's a nice one, sir. Yes, thank you. So this one, uh, this is Athar's, um, basically Athar showed multiple ECGs like that. And now put the poll box. This should be hundred percent correct. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I think um, and, uh, a fresh <laughs> memory. Do it, sir. We can now stop. Stop it. Show us the result. So 54% uh, says it is C, 40% D, hmm. and 4% uh, B. Atar, comment I on think, this, please. Sir, I think it is 100% as because the, the participants can see the P wave location. This is the regular narrow complex tagger. The heart rate is 150. Is just uh, 148 like this. Heart rate is just less than 140. Regular narrow complex tachycardia. So if we see the analysis, the morphology that is the location of the P wave. This is in the V1. This is the location of the P wave that is just at the beginning, just after the QRS complex at the beginning of the ST segment. And, and and I think that it is within just at the 80 millisecond from the previous QRS complex. Short RP. P is at the just 80 millisecond, giving rise to the and that is RSR pattern should work in case of the V and also the location of the P wave in case of the lead 2, lead 3 and the inferior lead that is just after the keyword is complex. Sir, I am in favor of the AVNRT. Yeah. Number 3. C. Number, yeah, I think if you look in lead V1, it's a very pointy P, retrograde P wave. It looks a little more than 18, but if you look at lead 2 or if, 3, yeah. This P wave is within 80 millisecond of the QRS complex, number one, and it is negative in 2, 3 AVF. So the primary diagnosis, I will always tell uh, AV node reentry. And I tell my patients or others that 90% of the time that will be correct. There can be some atypical um, accessory pathway. So the, 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 this, if we find this ECG, uh, negative P wave in 2, 3 AVF within 80 millisecond, I think AV node reentry is the primary diagnosis. Secondary diagnosis will be um, active ventricular reentry and tachycardia. It cannot be sinus tachycardia. Um, it is unlikely to be flutter because I can clearly see a P wave. I cannot see another P wave. So, uh, thank you. So, sir, can I, sir, can I go on, sir? Yes. Some of them are asking about the ASP depression. Which those is a who have of of the pathway yeah. very fast. Then the uh, the P wave in the V1 is looks uh, in infinity like here the pseudo R, but within the eight, some uh, accessory pathway or uh, concealed accessory pathway looks like I, I found in the EP lab. I thought it is infinity, but in, in EP lab it is accessory pathway because the, the exit pathway is very fast. So a V node at two minutes can take it maybe in this case. Absolutely yes, right. Yes, so, yes sir. Yes sir. I do agree with uh, Dr. Morrison. I had such type of uh, uh, problem. I thought it was a VNRT, but later I found this left post perceptual pathway, uh, concealed pathway. Okay, let me summarize what Dr. Morrison and uh, uh, Dr. Jamil say. Is, you see, AV node is in the center of the heart. Yes. And the PR in RP is very short. But if there is an accessory pathway just near the AV node, it will look exactly same. That's why when I look at this ECG, I always tell people I'm correct 90% of the time. I will never say 100% of the time. 90% of the time I'm correct, 10% I'll be off. And that determination we make in the EP level. And that is the reason that when we study these patients, sometimes when we think of node reentry, even in the lab, there can be confusion. and we can fail to ablate them because actually we did not understand the mechanism 
even in the lab. And in what I'm thinking is avionode reentry, but actually this is an accessory pathway, a concealed pathway, which is either on the left side, just near the septum, which can give rise to the similar picture. But for all academic purposes, 90% of the time, this is going to be avionode reentry. The next ECG is same. Um, I'm going to skip it. Uh, we have other ECGs, so there is a P wave retrograde here. And uh, the mechanism, uh, we're not going to have any questions. So the whole point is this, this is a re-entrance circuit in the AV node, going down the slow pathway, coming back to the fast pathway, and the QRS comp will be first QRS, and then there is the A wave. That's why you see the timing here will be within 80 milliseconds of the QRS complex. How about this one? Heart rate is around 200 beats per minute in this patient with narrow QRS. You can show the pull box. Yes, the time is over. You can show the result. Sir, 41% it is D. Uh, for 34% it is C. 17% A, 8% B. Yeah. Um, Atahar or Moshin, comment or Jamil? So, uh... Close the poll box. It's narrow, narrow complex tachycardia. And uh, there are some uh, definite P waves in the V5, V6, uh, as well as in mid standard one. Uh, it can be discerned. And so it's uh, a long RP tachycardia. So I go in favor of HL tachycardia, maybe an atypical AVRT. In favor of the active ventricular reentry, AVRT, because you can see the P wave after the uh, 80, after 80 milliseconds. So most likely the active ventricular reentry with RP wave aberration. Yeah. Why not atrial flutter? Some people say atrial flutter. Why not atrial flutter? That's a possibility. Okay. It's a it, it, yeah, yeah, to one is to one, so it is, uh, and then it's it can happen. <laughs> yeah, so but, sir, this is the part. If it is a real flutter, it will be one to one flutter. That means it's a little slow flutter. Okay. If it's two to one, that's too fast a flutter. That's one. Now, the which is the P wave? In V6, there is a positive. Is it the P wave? Or in lead one, there is a notching of this thing, is it the P wave? If I take the notch as the P wave, then it's a long RP tachycardia. That makes the diagnosis of atrioventricular reentry more likely. And look at the bottom rhythm, how it ended. ended. If we look at this T wave, there is a distortion here, and after that, there is no distortion. And that helps me identify where the P wave is. Most probably, this negative component was the P wave in here. And so this, by this ECG, clearly, I mean, first diagnosis will be atrial ventricular reentry. Second, atrial tachycardia. Um, atrial flutter is very, very unlikely diagnosis in this case. Um, so this is the patient. Patient had actually WPW syndrome, and that was induced in the EP lab and atrial ventricular reentry uh, tachycardia. But please remember, in all these, all these are possible diagnoses. That's why I put those things in there. And again, the, how it happens that you go down through the AV node, produce a narrow QRS, and then come back up to the accessory pathway. How about this one? You can see heart rate is 140.
कामरूल भाई प्लीज लॉन्च द पोल पोल या You can stop now. Yes. So forty uh, percent shows it's D, thirty percent C, and twenty percent, twenty-one percent B, nine percent A. Okay. This is Athar C C G. B. Athar. Sir, V one is your heart rate or normal? Yes. So V one, V two is clue to this C G. I mean, heart rate is one forty. These are all of those are possibilities. In Atar, please comment on that. Sir, uh, actually, yes. you showed you showed a similar ECG. Stop the poll box. Yeah. Yes, sir. This is a. case of the long rp tachycardia and all these things that we should consider that is the pu that is a regular narrow complex tachycardia heart rate is 140 that is one nearly 150 and the pu wave is positive just uh, in front of the qrs complex in the uh, v1 also the clear uh, pu wave we can see in v2 and all the leads we can see there but except this one so this is one of the example of the so long rp tachycardia that is yeah. rp is longer than the pr so again the differential diagnosis may be the avnrt atypical avnrt particularly or sometimes it may be the avrt or atrial flutter is definitely one of the possibilities when we look at the lead 2 and lead 3 but considering all these things sir i am in favor of the uh, avnrt atypical avnrt okay sure so the point was here is if you look at lead v2 you can see a p wave very clearly normal pr interval that makes the diagnosis of atrial tachycardia or some other reaction but what was bothering me was lead v1 yes you are complex looks funny there i mean there is there are two terminal r wave that is possible but unlikely so i kept thinking is this a second p wave and i can see the similar thing in lead v2 there is a notch after the qrs and then if you put a caliper there you will find that the timing is exactly same and this is the first i think and then second i will take a caliper and then i will measure the interval to see if they measure and they did measure and then remember the date 26 april at 11:36 am same day another ecg sorry same day an hour later the rate has slowed down and you can see the flutter sure. very clear so this was atrial flutter with two to one conduction but of course the other diagnoses are also possibilities and that is the whole point that look at carefully in the ecg look at the v1 now you don't see the second notch i'm going to go back you see the v1 there is a notch here v2 there is a notch and when i go to this one v2 looks still looks funny but in v1 that notch is gone almost because it's v2 that uh -huh. it is funny because you know there is some overlap somewhere but not on a regular basis so this is typical atrial flutter and it's a sort of appearing flutter in lead 2 3 avr so this was typical flutter so this this is actually a study that i did when i was in england uh, um no later on it it's in los angeles so this is the we induced this tachycardia during electrophysiology study and i have given the choices what are the diagnoses so kamrul bhai poll launch karen
of the poll. Chop it, Kamal bhai. Yeah. So sixty-two uh, percent says it's D. That is SBT with RBB. Okay. And nineteen percent it is ventricular tachycardia. And eleven percent atrial flutter with RBB. And eight percent atrial fibrillation with RBB. Okay. I will take all those diagnoses except C. Why not C? Because this is very regular. Regular, yes. Please remember one thing: if something is very regular, one thing it is not. It is not atrial fibrillation, so that is totally out of question. The rest of them are possibilities, and of course, I agree with majority of the audience. SVT with right bundle, and look at lead V1, small r, big r. But then again, it's a little bit monophasic, not typical right bundle. I had the luxury of having 12 DCG on this patient, so that made my so having an old DCG helps. And this is the 12 DCG. Patient had baseline right bundle bind block, and I induced tachycardia, so it became um, right bundle bind block. So we will discuss it a little bit. I, it brings it to the next ECG, um, and I have put the computer diagnosis. So we'll discuss both of them together because that will clarify uh, the point. And uh, Dr. Other doctor sent me an ECG um, from, um, in my messenger, and this is the his ECG is exactly same as this ECG, and that's why I thought that we'll discuss it. Heart rate is 135. So the pull box. Can stop now. So, uh, thirty-nine percent says it is SBT with RBB. Twenty-one percent sinus tachycardia with RBB. Eight percent atrial fibrillation, and thirty-two percent ventricular tachycardia. Again, if we discuss this, one diagnosis that I will not take is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. Yes. I, that is not a diagnosis because. Um, it, it's very regular. Everything else is a possibility. Now, this ECG looks deceptively narrow. If you look at lead V1, it looks narrow. V2 may be narrow, but if you measure it carefully in other leads, like lead 2, it's actually 160 milliseconds. So the right bundle branch block pattern with QRS more than 140 helps Tilt towards ventricular tachycardia. And then there are a few other criteria that we can use. Here it is. The RBB morphology in lead V1, monophasic R wave, or QR pattern, or RS pattern in lead V1 suggest VT. And if you look at lead V1 here, it is a QR pattern. And that such as VT. In lead V6, you can have any of those morphologies, but RS ratio less than one, which it does not fulfill. There is another criteria for VT that in any chest lead from the beginning of the QRS complex to the deepest point of S wave, if it is more than 100 milliseconds, that's VT. In this case, it is 110 milliseconds. So given all those criteria, this is VT. QR pattern in V1, more than 160 millisecond, and this beginning of the R to deepest point of S, more than 110 millisecond, it is VT. Well, I'm just claiming it to be VT. Is it really VT? So let's look at this. This patient, I'm not going to give you the background. This is July 13th, and the patient was put on amiodarone. Look at July 28th, patients present with a similar tachycardia at a rate of 103. And now you can see something. Look at here. In lead V1 rhythm space, there's a P wave. There's a P wave. There's a, am I making it up? And then what I did, I pulled up intracardiac recordings. 
If you look in the bottom strip, this is the atrial signal, atrial channel, and this is the ventricular channel. This is the ECG. You can see P wave here. The big signals are P wave, and the small signals are far field ventricular electrogram. That clearly proves the diagnosis. So if anybody had any doubt, I mean, this is how we, we reinforce our knowledge. We applied this AV dissociation formula, but one can say, well, Dr. Ahmed, you just made it up. And then, sure, it is possible that I'm just imagining it, but when I look at the intracardiac signal, I can clearly see this. So that brings us back that those criteria that were designed is correct. That means a QR pattern in V1 with right bundle, and then duration here more than 110 milliseconds from beginning of the R to the deepest S point, and that makes it VT. And that is the same ECG Dr. Dutta has sent me on the messenger. That one shows the QR pattern, and also this duration is more than 100 milliseconds. That is ventricular tachycardia. I think we're going to stop here. There are questions about management of white QRS in ICU. I think we should leave it for a different time um, session, right, Atha? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. 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 Now, okay. Atatha, you should go to the next section. Next section. Yes, sir. Yeah. Everybody is so engrossed in the uh, uh, discussion. Actually, we have spent so much time, but we do not uh, actually look at that. I share a screen. Is it, can you see the ECG? Uh, not no, yet. Sir. No, no sir. screen share. Bond the code. This one. It our share code. Same problem. Screen share. Okay. 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 What was silly? Get like then, sir. I mean, screen share. I'm going to do. 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 I'm going Yes. 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 And this is the ECG for Professor Abdul Wadu Choudhury. This is the Choudhury's ECG, and he is the best person, and he is the most expert person to discuss this ECG. Professor Choudhury, you just. This is a real life scenario. The patient came to me last week. And the main person, diabetic hypertensive, he had an episode of chest pain a few weeks back. He was not mentioning that. He came with uh, the complaint that he is having some shortness of breath while walking upstairs. He didn't have that before. And on a questioning, he uh, said that he, he had an episode of chest pain uh, around five to six weeks back. Now, look at the ECG. That 12 ECG, initial ECG, they sent me uh, over the WhatsApp. I see that sinus rhythm, uh, limb leads unremarkable. In the chest lip, V1, quite all right, but a little bit taller. But V2, the transition is too early, and the T wave is too beautiful. V2 should not show such a good quality T wave. And in accompaniment of a tall R, we should think of something else. So I asked my assistant over phone, 
they do the posterior lips. And look at that, P7, P8, P9. That is keyword. Actually, the patient had posterior MI. Yeah. Now, answers, please. Tall are in V1 and T upright in V1. Tall are actually most importantly, most visible in V2. V2. Yes, sir. V2 is more prominent. Pronounced. Our T upright. T upright, sir. T is too beautiful. I want to say that. Yes, sir. Whenever you have that, you have to have posterior lead to exclude or confirm the diagnosis of posterior MI. The most important thing is if you do not have the suspicion, index of suspicion in your mind, you are going to miss it. And unfortunately, if you give this 12 lead CT to the echocardiographer, very often they also miss the posterior wall MI. They say some, uh, maybe the LP dysfunction is there. And uh, this is the old case. That's why they do not have an ST depression. The patient had history of chest pain quite a few weeks back. If it is earlier, the ST depression, if it is there, then it would have been a acute to posterior MI. It's not that. I think uh, last week we had uh, inferior MI, posterior MI, but this one is true posterior MI. Sir, yes, sir. I think uh, regarding the our participant has nicely uh, captured this diagnosis actually, sir. Most of the participant has correctly diagnosed this case of the old posterior MI in the Facebook. So I think Professor Choudhury is very much correct. He wants to teach how to diagnose the posterior MI, acute posterior MI, the old posterior MI. This is the old posterior MI. In the last week, we have shown that the infrared, that is the posterior extension of the inferior MI. And this week, this is the true posterior MI. This is the Very old true posterior MI. And this is the technique how to diagnose the true posterior MI. And I think the Professor uh, Choudhury's uh, effort is actually uh, I mean, successful. Actually, participant has nicely captured this concept that is how to diagnose the posterior MI. Sir, I think we is quite late. Uh, now, so if the poster, we can finish. Post for the next post for the next Saturday. Tarek. Post at the Dekaba? Sir. Tushan, Ashley, O Shabimatru, Covid Tikishi, Utiche, Akuntar, Simi, the Bashar, the Murubira, Tadikini, Akan Hashpatri Gurchi, Tadishova Junu Dakuri at Kambra. It a Borokura China? I think Next Saturday, we'll have a CG fish. The fiesta decoding LPA meets our own, our beloved graphic will be there, along with Dr. Abhishek Deshmukh. They'll be talking about the blade APS and the tech APS. So, we are eagerly awaiting for that, and everybody are invited in there, along with your friends and acquaintances. Airport Pascola is helping us, along with our own favorite Beximco, who are always there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir. So, we are going to conclude this session. Uh, what is sir? Uh, no, this is, we, we do not have any formal way of ending things. We are actually so saying good night and assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and good night. Good night, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bexinko. Thank you, all the panelists you, and teachers. Thank you all. And Firo.
Thank you, sir. Wonderful moderator. Uh, we want to have. Please do come. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent you, moderation, Firuz Bhai. Sure. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Sir, kitu pa boi lecture. Sir, Govindo. Yes, sir.